Greetings. My name is Jeff Fine, and I currently serve as clerk of the Arizona Superior Court for Maricopa County. Here at the clerk's office, we aspire to be as helpful as possible to those we serve, the residents of Maricopa County. Our team works in the courtrooms, at front counters, and in many other areas here in one of our nation's largest courts. Each day our team processes over 9,000 financial transactions and generates over 2,000 minute entries. And each year we receive and manage over 150,000 exhibits and pieces of evidence, process hundreds of thousands of incoming documents, allocate over $118 million in restitution, fines and fees, and handle over 350,000 inquiries by phone. These are just a few of the things that we do, and we are working hard to improve access to helpful information and services. In addition to the services we provide, we believe it is helpful to share news and information about the current issues in our courts. One of the ways we do this is through social media and through videos like this. So today, we introduce the Clerk Minute, a new video series where we ask individuals from the courts to share information about current issues, services and initiatives. We hope you find it helpful and informative. So let's get started. In Arizona, the judicial branch of government has several committees and work groups where court personnel, other stakeholders, and members of the public meet to discuss current issues and engage in efforts to improve services, efficiency, and access, for example. In recent years, several task forces were formed to discuss and investigate opportunities for improvement in areas, such as how courts can be more helpful to individuals who represent themselves, mental health cases, bail, how to best accommodate the growing amount of digital evidence that is coming into the courts with body cams and smartphone video and many other important and relevant topics. Today we are pleased to have with us Vice Chief Justice Ann Timmer of the Arizona Supreme Court, who chairs the Arizona Legal Services Task Force that was formed in late 2018. Justice Timmer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jeff, I'm delighted to be here. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background leading up to your appointments as a Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court and as Chair of the Legal Services Task Force. Well, sure. Uh, I, I consider myself really a, an Arizona native at this point. I moved here with my family when I was 14 years old. I went to high school here locally and uh, loved it, loved Arizona. I found it to be the most friendly place th that I've lived in uh, as a child, and I never wanted to go anywhere else. So indeed, I stayed here for college. I went to the University of Arizona in Tucson, and then I went to Arizona State University for law school, that, which is now the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law. I practiced for 15 years in the Phoenix area with private law firms, mostly doing business disputes, mostly representing just people uh, and, and entities. And also did a little bit of capital murder cases, though. So it's either business or capital capital murder. Uh, I married one of my law school classmates, and we've had three kids uh, in here and raised them through through uh, school and college. And uh, after about 15 years, uh, I applied for and was appointed to the Arizona Court of Appeals by Governor Jane Hull. I served on that court for 12 years doing appeals and was a, a chief judge for the last three years or so of my term there. So I got involved in a lot of administrative responsibilities and oversight uh, while with that court. I applied for the Arizona Supreme Court and was fortunate enough to be appointed in 2000 by Governor Jan Brewer. And I've been on that court for seven years now. In July, I was elected the Vice Chief Justice, which really just means that in addition to everything else I do in deciding cases, I'm on even more administrative task force and committees and commissions. Many people don't realize what the Supreme Court oversees uh, more than just deciding cases, but lots of different things, the running of the court system and the legal system. For part of that position, I've attended a lot of national events and have picked up, as well as my colleagues, that uh, there really has become a gap in civil justice, meaning people are either foregoing their legal problems or accessing the court to resolve them, or they're trying to do it themselves. It's become a very ex sometimes expensive, but an often frustrating experience for many people. 
And as we've seen here in Arizona, many people simply try to go it alone and don't have the services of an attorney, and it's very difficult. So I think that as part of that, that was the reason that the court formed the Legal Services Task Force to explore alternate means to get more services for just regular people. And also, I volunteered to be the chair of this. It's something that I really wanted to be a part of, to be able to explore different ways to, to help people out on, in the state that I love and where I've raised my children, and I want to make sure people have the access to court that I would expect for my own family members. My next question is, studies show that the number of individuals choosing to represent themselves in court has steadily increased over the years. Why do you believe this is occurring, and is the Arizona Legal Services Task Force part of a response to this? Well, I'll take the first part of the question first. Why is it happening? There's a, there's a lot of theories about why it is happening, and it is happening uh, nationwide. It's not just worldwide, really, not just in, in Arizona. And there's a number of factors, in my opinion, that have led to that. Uh, first, you have the fact, as I've already uh, mentioned, lawyers uh, are expensive. I think that the average, one study says that the average billing rate for a small firm or solo practitioner is $260 an hour which is really expensive for any of us, myself included, to get a, a lot of legal services uh, at, that, at that hourly rate. So that's part of it. Uh, and by the way, it's not that lawyers are simply greedy. Lawyer, it's expensive to get a legal education these days. And I'll tell you that the, the uh, amount of loans that are taken out are uh, massive for them. So they have expenses, they have to get that paid back, uh, overhead other, their own employees. Uh, it is not um, an inexpensive venture these days to be a lawyer, so that's part of it. Uh, also part of it is our society, the way it's developed, we're all used to doing things on our own. I mean, if you go and decide, I wanna learn how to uh, replace my uh, faucet in the, in the bathroom, uh, odds are, because we all know plumbers are also expensive, that you, let's just go onto YouTube. Let's see about, maybe I can figure out how to do this on my own if I really try and, and save some money. So it's a really a do-it-yourself culture that we have, and that's held, held true in legal services. So first thing you want to do and figure out, oh, I need a, um, a, a divorce. Well, I can Google that <laughs> and see what I can come up with on my own. I'm sure there's forms around, advice I can get, that kind of thing. Um, and before you even think in terms of getting a lawyer or getting legal assistance. So that, that's also part of, part of the reason I think that, um, that we've seen uh, fewer people uh, using, using lawyers and, and such. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the second part of your question, which was, is that what, what led to the Legal Services Task Force? Yes, in part, uh, because do-it-yourself is not always easy in every case. Sometimes it is, and the courts have developed and the clerk's offices have developed forms and, and such for pretty routine matters that people can do it on their own. But there are many cases where you cannot. Uh, and the courts have tried their best to make rules simple, but we've run, kind of reached the point where we can't simplify things anymore and still cover the range of, of, of issues that are important to, to cover in the rules. So, so what do we do? And that's where we're finding the gap, that people either do one of two things. They forego have, they're addressing their legal problems at all, which is what we don't want them to do, or they try to muddle through on their own and, and unfortunately mess up their own case. And that's not something that, that anyone wants. It also uh, impedes the courts themselves because it clogs up courts with, with mistakes being made and having to do things over that, that makes for an inefficient court as well. So all of these things and more really have, have led to the formation of the task force. My next question is, similar to the initiative years ago that led to the creation of the Legal Document Preparer Program that helps self-represented litigants, the task force has recommended investigating development of an additional type of legal professional that can assist people who may not be able to afford an attorney. Could you please tell us more about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, as you know, uh, the Supreme Court created the Legal Document Preparer Program back in 2003 with the idea to help people with, with simple legal forms, uh, and sometimes maybe not so simple legal forms, 
sometimes people have difficulty filling them out and just need somebody that is familiar with what, what the little blank spaces are looking for to help them out. So the Supreme Court licenses and certifies people that are capable of, of helping out with, with legal forms. And they've been doing that since 2003 uh, around the state of Arizona. But legal document preparers cannot give legal advice. And many times people want to ask that question of not how to fill out a document, but which one should I use or what should I do? Legal document preparers, or LDPs as we call them, are not licensed to do that. So right now, we all, you only have a choice if you want legal assistance in the community between an LDP who can just help you fill out a form and a lawyer who can give you the full panoply of, of rights uh, that a lawyer can give you. And there's nothing in between. We've been analogizing ourselves to the medical profession a bit. Um, and as you know, since you're on our task force, we've had a lot of discussion about what happened 50 or 60 years ago in the, in the medical profession. Uh, back then in the 50s, before either of us were, were born or even thought of, um, if you wanted to have a flu shot, if you wanted to have your blood drawn, you had to get a, a licensed doctor to do that. Today, of course, you wouldn't. You, there you have phlebotomists that will take your blood. And in fact, you might prefer a phlebotomist to take your blood than your doctor. You have a nurse practitioner who doesn't have to work in Arizona under the supervision of a doctor to do a certain amount of medical tasks uh, as that person is trained to do. You have physician's assistants who work under the supervision of a doctor. Uh, the idea is that you don't always need uh, the top. You don't always need surgery to remove a, a splinter, so to speak. Uh, we're thinking in terms of the legal profession, uh, it's, it's really true as well. Uh, you need a lawyer for many things, and they're the gold standard. That's when you need legal help, uh, you really should, we should do everything we can to make sure you get that legal representation. But there are some things or, that you don't need uh, a, a lawyer for, potentially. And that's really what our task force zoned in on, of can we look at a particular area of law, family law, for example, uh, where most people are not represented by attorneys, at least in, in Arizona. Uh, the vast majority are, rep, try to do it on their own. So, our, And many times, it's, there's not a lot of controversy. If you're not splitting up a bunch of property, if you don't have child custody issues and complicated uh, business transactions to, to unfold as a result of a, a divorce, uh, you don't, might not need a lawyer. So can, is there a tier of people that we can ensure our, our, to educate, to license, to certify, to develop a code of ethics for, to hold them to a standard uh, of, of ethics, so to speak, and representation that we can deploy to help people out in that middle tier. Hopefully that also would be a tier that wouldn't charge as much as lawyers and can give you that kind of, you know, nurse practitioner, if you will, assistance. Justice Timmer, my next question is, it appears that one goal of the task force is to make legal services available through alternative means. Could you please share any thoughts about what these alternative means might look like? Sure. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the things lawyers are allowed to do since about 2003 is to deliver what we call unbundled services. And that the task force found and the Supreme Court has found that not many lawyers know about it or use it, and certainly not many people in the community know about it. What's unbundled services? Unbundled services is just simply a lawyer taking a piece of a legal problem, providing you representation on that piece, and then l allowing the, the client to handle the rest of it on his or her own. So I'll give you a good example. Uh, I have a friend who got a divorce a few years ago. She and her husband, their, their kids are grown up, so no complications there, but they certainly had to divide up property. Uh, they're both intelligent people, so they negotiated their own deal between the two. They didn't have lawyers involved. Negotiate their own deal uh, and write down a, a, a property disposition agreement. I'm, I'm blanking a little bit on the term, but you know, some kind of contract that says this is how we're going to divide everything in our dissolution action with the idea that we're then going to present it to the judge and get that approved and that'll be part of our divorce decree. So they did all of that on their own. Uh, that's something that typically a lawyer will do for you, but they did it on their own. But they wanted to make sure, each of them, that they weren't uh, causing any problems or stepping in any minefields. So my friend, uh, and I assume the other party as well, uh, she took her document to her lawyer. 
and hire a lawyer just for a, a limited amount of money, and the only thing they had to do is not negotiate, not do any of that, but simply look at my document and let me know, do I have any problems here? Is there something that I have neglected to put in this agreement that will come back to haunt me in a few years? And sure enough, the lawyer uh, identified a couple of things to, that should have been addressed but were not. My friend said it was, it was the best money, really, she ever spent uh, to get that done. Everything then was completed, they, they finalized it, it's filed, it's done. That's an example of unbundled services. And, and we're finding that family lawyer, some family lawyers will take advantage of it and are just starting to market those, those type of services. We're looking to see, well, what about other areas of law? Because there's many you can do in, in landlord-tenant, in uh, debt collection, there's, there's little snippets of pieces, just my, you know, contract uh, disputes that you might have. I mean, really, it's unlimited in the civil arena only and to, to see about just getting a limited amount of help to kind of give you that booster, so to speak, uh, to go on with your own representation. So that's one example. Uh, around the state, we're doing, uh, we're making a lot of recommendations regarding what are, are called court navigators. Um, some courts have very robust self-help centers navigator uh, systems, navigators being just what it sounds like. You come to court, it's a huge complex down here. It's like, well, where do I even go? I mean, this is our simple things. Where do I go? Um, where is the self-help center? Where is the courtroom? Those types of things. Uh, in Maricopa County, you have groups, um, I think they're mostly from Arizona State University who volunteer to do just that, help people navigate through where they need to go in the system. Uh, other counties don't have the money Maricopa has and a much less uh, in, in resource, much fewer resources. So, but nevertheless, they have maybe one person who is there charged just with that duty to just to direct people and give them also a little bit of, of comfort because it's a scary place sometimes coming to a courthouse and having that. We get used, we're used to it, but for uh, the public walking in, um, it can be an intimidating place. So we're trying to see what we could do about having all counties, all 15, have navigator programs and maybe offer a little more meaningful assistance as well. So those are just two, two examples uh, that we have. Now, Justice, I know that the, the, uh, the group has been meeting uh, for uh, several months now, since late, late 2018, and uh, we discussed some of the recommendations that have come out of the task force. What are the next steps in the, in the evolution of this conversation? Well, as you say, we've been meeting all year and, and worked very, very hard. Any conversation, would, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the hard work of the group. And also that it's not just lawyers and judges uh, on the task force. As you know, you were on the task force, uh, as well as representatives from people outside the judicial system, uh, because this really is a court system that belongs to the people who live in Arizona. So that kind of segues into what happens next. We've taken this through a number of court committees, including the Arizona Judicial Council, which again is a, is a body of people from all over the state, some not in the judicial system, uh, who advise the Supreme Court on the direction the court should take in policy matters. I presented this task force report to that body last week up in Flagstaff, and they've accepted the report, which means that the next steps are that the task force, uh, under my name, will file what's called a rule petition in January, which will implement or will kick off and recommend a lot of these rule changes that are necessary to create this third tier that we're talking about to shore up some aspects of the legal document preparer program to make it a little bit better and to make some other court rule changes that go to this issue of access to justice. Then that rule petition will be for public comment and we have a rules form in, this, on this, in the Supreme Court which allows people just to sign in to read the petitions and to make a comment which I advise anyone interested in this to please comment because we want to know the good, the bad, the potential consequences of any, any change that we haven't thought of. Uh, that, that will go till May and then uh, the, through the summer we'll digest the rule petition, the comments, and my colleagues and I will get together in August and thoroughly hash out not only this rule petition, but a number of others that are typically filed, about 40 or so, to decide whether we should have this program. So in August, we'll either decide to uh, have the program or can continue that petition to continue to develop the idea to get a little bit more specificity. Because while we're very anxious to have uh, additional help for people, 
in resolving their legal problems. We don't want to move precipitously so that we actually end up harming the public in a way. So it's, we want to move forward, but we do so with both eyes open and both ears open. And so that, those are the next steps that we'll be taking. Justice Timmer, I would like to thank you for joining us today on this very important subject. And I'd also like to thank you for being our first guest uh, uh, on the Clerk Minute. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, I have found and I know that uh, those that we serve will find this information very helpful and informative. Uh, I just wanted to, to share with you that uh, in my over 20 years in the Arizona Judicial Branch, I've never seen a time uh, where it appears that w we are more focused on uh, helping people navigate an increasingly complex and some, somewhat expensive uh, and scary uh, to some individuals who represent themselves, the, the system itself. Uh, and uh, things such as the Access to Justice Commission, the Fair Justice Task Force, and this particular uh, task force go a long way toward helping individuals uh, navigate the system and have access to justice. So I would like to thank you for again for joining us today. We appreciate it so much and we look forward to seeing what happens with these recommendations. Give a, sh a shout out to the deputy clerks out there and to the public who comes to the counters. Uh, please recall that, that the deputy clerks, they're, they're the face really of the branch. That's, those are the people that see most of our customers and we're so appreciative of the job they do and usually with a smiling face. Uh, so I ask the members of the public to, to be you know, patient too with the clerks because they're doing their best to get people through our courthouses efficiently and, and have accurate information recorded and such. So I really appreciate the job that the deputy clerks do uh, and hopefully so does the public. Outstanding, thank you Judge. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.